So while we were worshiping, um, Yanelli was singing, he loves you, he loves you, he loves you. And I had a vision one day. I was sitting on a curb, and I was pulling the petals off a daisy. And I just kept saying, he loves me, he loves me, he loves me, he loves me. And he said, and that's right, and I never not love you. It's not like he loves me, he loves me not, like you normally would say. He just said, he loves you. He says, I never not love you. I was so good. And Easter, the Lord said, while we were worshiping to thankful, he said, I want you to tell her that he is well pleased with your sacrifice of praise. So let's just pray. And welcome to those of you who are online. Maybe one day you'll come visit with us. We would love to have you here. But Father, we just thank you that you are spirit and you are truth, Lord God. And Father, as we just dive into this, Lord God, I ask that you just be the spirit of truth and speak to every heart, Lord God, where the enemy has lied, where the enemy has convinced things that are just not true about who we are, about who you are, and about who others are. And Father, we just thank you that as you uncover and reveal tonight, God, freedom will come. Freedom will come because you are the spirit of truth. And we just thank you. We, your presence is here, God. And we are just basking in it even as, we, as I teach, Lord, and we listen. Father, we thank you that your presence is so thick. And it's just ripe for healing. And we just thank you in Jesus' name. So my first question to you is, how many of you said, I would never be like my mom, or I would never be like my dad, or I would never marry somebody like my dad, <laughs> or I would never marry like somebody like my mom, or I will always protect my kids, I won't ask you to raise your hands because I know you probably all said one of those things. Well, those are inner vows. The first clue is it says never or always. If you say never or always in a, a, a sentence like that, you have an inner vow. And they're like boomerangs. And Ray, do you have that clip? Hey, we're, it, this clip is about three seconds, so you got to watch really hard. First of all, there were many different boomerangs used in Aboriginal culture, and they all had different purposes. A club boomerang would be used to finish off an animal after it had been speared. A hook boomerang was used in warfare, and as you can see, this is a returning boomerang. And it has a slight taper over the blade of the boomerang for its aerodynamic so it can fly through the air beautifully. And on the underside, it's just nice and flat so it can cut through the air. When you throw a boomerang, it should be 45 degrees on an angle like that and 30 degrees into the air. When you throw the boomerang, just hold it behind your head and flick with the wrist. Flick with the wrist, okay? 45 degree angle and 30 degrees into the air. We'll give it a go. Thank you, Ray. That is what an inner vow does. It boomerangs right back at you. <laughs> Except you don't want to catch that one. <laughs> that one you want to nail to the cross, okay? So it, Elijah House says an inner vow <clears throat> is a determination or directive made by the mind and heart early in life. That key, that's the key part. But the, the, key part, the really big key part is that they are more powerful than bitter root judgments. So we all know what a bitter root judgment is. It's when we judge somebody with our heart, with an ugly attitude. And then we say, I will never be like them. Big difference from saying, 
I would, when I grow up, I don't want to be like that because that hurts. And your heart is pure. When you say, I would never be like that, and you have like a pride kind of a thing going on, that's when you're in trouble. And you have a judgment. Although they are made early in life, they are forgotten, which is why they are called inner vows. But they act as directives that control our responses to situations and the people around us. Even if we can't remember them, you can tell by the fruit that they're there. Because some people say, I never said that. I never said that when I was a kid. Well, they're inner, and you don't really remember most of it, but you see the fruit in your life, and that's how you trace back usually bitter root judgments and inner vows. Now, there's two different um, places. I looked up inner vows, and I had never quite heard it like this in 25 years. It says, inner vows are not usually thought through on a conscious level, but strangely enough, they have, they have a way of becoming a permanent binding force in our lives if left unchallenged. An inner vow is a binding promise that made to oneself that shouts never again. I had never quite heard it like that. It's an, a binding promise that we make to ourselves, shouting never again. And that results, that came from like, a wound, a threatening thing in your life, maybe a trauma that you had in your life. In situations where they're left unspoken, another um, place described it as a silent scream. And you know when you're in a situation and you're going in your heart, not out of your mouth, no, you know that no, that's, you can't scream it, but you're screaming it inside. Something, up, something rises up in you that says, I need to protect myself, or I need to protect the people around me. Maybe your children. Maybe it's somebody else in your family. It's in, you start trusting yourself instead of trusting God to protect you. And it's never a great idea when you're trying to protect yourself because you really can't do as good a job as he does ever. Inner vows, another place, it says, they are the armor we wear in hopes to protect and empower us. Since they are forged by judgments, they only attract more hurt and more abuse. Unfortunately, they are not the armor of God in Ephesians 6.11 that says, put on the full armor of God for his precepts are like the splendor armor of a heavily armed soldier so that you may be able to successfully stand up against the schemes and strategies and the deceits of the devil. That's protection. Our inner vows are not our protection, even though the enemy tries to make us think that they are. Inner vows come out of bitter root judgments and hearts of stone. In Hebrews 12, 15, it says, looking carefully, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God, lest the um, root of bitterness spring up and cause trouble, and by this many are defiled. That's what happens when you have a bitter root judgment. In Ezekiel 36, 26, it says, I will plant a new heart and a new spirit inside of you, and I will take out your stubborn, stony heart and give you a willing, tender heart of flesh. Sometimes there's a little tug of war with that because hearts of flesh get hurt. Stony hearts, if I bang on this, it's not going to hurt as much if, if it was something soft and supple. My fist might go through it, right? So sometimes that exchange is a hard one for people to make. In Ezekiel 11, 19, in the Amplified, it says, and I will give them one heart, a new heart, and I will put a new spirit within them. I will take away from them the heart of stone and give them a heart of flesh that is responsive to my touch. Now, inner vows are obstructions to our nature and specifically to the function it holds, how we think, act, or feel. They only obstruct us. 
They may even have the power to obstruct us, our physical development. And in Elijah House, there was an example that they gave where this, uh, a woman was not able to develop into a woman. And they went and they prayed, and they prayed with her, and they realized that she had an inner vow. And once they broke that inner vow, I mean, they broke it and she left. And like a year later, they were at another conference and this lady came up to them and she had totally, they're like, she goes, do you remember me? Do you remember me? And it wasn't until they explained, of course, who, you know, she explained who she was. She had broken the vow and her body was able to develop as a woman because she broke the vow. We had another girl in the class and at 219, and she was a tiny little thing. And she had made a vow that she never wanted to grow up. And when we broke the vow, she literally grew like two or three inches. I mean, we saw it firsthand. It wasn't Elijah House doing it. It was like right here. And it was like, oh, my gosh, this is, you know, like you see it on Elijah House. But then when you see it in person, it's like a whole new level. Anyway, <clears throat> so traits of an inner vow, they're common to individuals. Almost every single person has at least one, <laughs> even if you don't think you do. <laughs> Come to see me in Easter. We'll show you where they are. <laughs> they're powerful. And you can make them as an adult, but they don't carry the same power that the ones you do from when you're a child. Because those are hidden. The ones you make as an adult, you kind of remember. But I remember one time, you know, Elijah House is like um, an everyday thing in our house. So when our kids were younger, we were in the, I was in the car with my youngest daughter one day, and we're driving, and she starts to say something, and she goes, oh, no, I'm not going to say that. That's an inner vow. And then I'm going to end up doing that. And I definitely don't want to do that. So it's good. It's like kids should learn this stuff. You know, that they would have a lot less problems in life if they knew what we know now. I remember at 219, people, when we taught bitter root judgments, people would be like screaming. Like, what? Huh? Why didn't anybody tell me? Like out loud, people would say, why didn't anybody tell me this a long time ago? I would have been free a long time ago. Okay, they're difficult um, to identify because they're hidden. But you usually it's, you see the fruit and then you know they're there. They refuse to change. Just because you mature, or I'm going to tell you, even if you do forgiveness, they don't go away. They have to be renounced. So people will say, oh, but I forgave, and I did this, and I did judgments, and I did that. Vows have to be renounced, and then they can be broken. And inner vows don't always manifest immediately. It's like a little time clock ticking. And at the exact moment of ripeness, click and it comes into play and it might not be until you're a parent it might not be till the day you say I do I mean we've had people say the minute I said I do everything in our world changed like the minute we had somebody say it was immediate like they couldn't even believe it they said they didn't even like it was like who did I just marry it was that severe because the time clock, tick, 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 boom. <laughs> you know, it's like the cheerleaders. But it's very serious. So inner vows, when we judge another person and vow never to do what they did, the vow often works in reverse, just like that boomerang. And in Romans 2, 1, it says, Oh, man, whoever you are who you judge, for whatever you judge another, you condemn yourself. For you who practice, uh, judge practice the same thing, and it's usually worse. 
it's usually worse because the word says, sow a wind, reap a whirlwind. So it's usually, I remember the day I wasn't saved yet. Oh, I was saved, but I didn't know any of this stuff. And my dad used to scream all the time when we were kids, and it really bothered me. And I remember the day I was walking past my mirror in my foyer, and I was screaming at one of my kids. And the Lord let me see my face as I was screaming. And I didn't know about this, and I went, oh, my gosh, I'm my dad, but only worse. And I I was like, Lord, forgive me. I didn't even know. I didn't know what to do until later on when I came here, but you don't need to know. You can tell this to an unsaved person, and they get it. They get it. So I gave you a couple of handouts. This one is the handout that looks like this. This is some inner vows. I'm not going to read all of them, but I will never let anyone love me. I will never be weak. I will never trust anyone, allow anyone to, uh, allow myself to need, let them take anything away from me. When we say anyone, that includes God. And so we're thinking, why isn't God doing this for me? Maybe it's because you have a vow or judgment that said, you can't hear me? Oh, there. Is that better? Okay. Thank you, Tim. Um, Maybe you have a vow or judgment that said, I would never let anyone close to me again, or I would never let anyone in, or I would never let anyone help me. Whatever it is, if it's anyone, that includes God. Now, this website called Jephath, or whatever it's called, okay, they, they did these inner vows, and I love the way they did it. And so I'm just going to read a couple of them. It says, the first one is, I will never let anyone touch me like that again. That's the vow. The pain you were protecting yourself from is physical or sexual abuse. The long-term results is the inability to be intimate when you want to be. Okay? That's one. I will always take care of myself. That is leaving God out of the equation as well. Do you wonder why he's not taking care of you? Because you told him, I will always take care of myself. The pain you were protecting yourself from was neglect from a caregiver. The long-term result is the inability to accept help from others when you need it. Another one, I will always, always is as bad as never, Because people go, well, how could that be a bad thing that I'll always protect my children? Because always makes you strive. Always makes you strive to do it. And you can never always do anything. Only Jesus can always do something. So it just, it makes you strive and you're eventually going to fail. So I will always protect my children. The pain you were protecting yourself is being unprotected by your parent. The long-term result is the inability to let yourself, to let your children take risks. So you see how an inner vow could actually put a stopgap on your children from actually maturing and growing into who they want, they're supposed to be. So there's, you know, long-term effects and there's, the pain, it, and that's what you have to look at when you're looking at your, the inner vows that you might have made. How do you break them? There's a handout. I gave you a handout. They are broken and dismantled by authority. The vows need to be renounced and broken. The first thing you need to do is recognize or remember the vow or look at the fruit to see that there's a, a vow in place. Now, this piece we've never done before, but I loved it, so I added it. I acknowledge the legitimate needs and desire that these vows are attempting to care for. I realized that I was trying in my own effort to control life and protect myself. I thought that was so good. That's going to be added to our, when we're doing ministry, because... 
It's acknowledging that it might feel legitimate to you to control your life because that's what inner vows do. But we think we're controlling our life, but the vow is even actually controlling you. Okay? This, the next thing you do is forgive the person who hurt you. And this is all after you've already broken the judgment that you made against the person who hurt you. Because breaking the judgment before you break the inner vow is usually important. And usually when you have a judgment in place, we can tell you what the vow is that came after that. You know, there's always a vow after a judgment. And then we confess and repent for our sinful reactions, which led us to making the vow. And then we renounce the vow. And we, the vows can be broken only by the authority given in the name of Jesus. Okay? So let's do one vow together. Okay? We're going to renounce one vow together. And I'm going to have to turn this back. I could, okay? So you think about an inner vow that you might have made. And even if you've broken it before, maybe think of that one. Okay? Okay, so we recognize what our vow is, and we're going to say, I acknowledge the legitimate needs and desires that these vows are attempting to care for. I realize that I was trying to do it in my own efforts to control life and protect myself. Lord, I choose to forgive the person, and you say who it is, who hurt you. And maybe it's yourself. I confess and repent for any sinful reactions which led me to make this vow. And I renounce this vow in the name of Jesus. And I break its power over my life in Jesus' name. Amen. So they're easy to break once you realize they're there. Okay. Hold on one second. All right. This was another little discovery. Okay. It's the anatomy of a wound by Bob Schultz. And he says that the anatomy of the wound highlights the emotional trauma, beliefs, and protective vows. At the heart is the wound. So we start with the wound. We just repented for the wound, right? We repented and forgave the person who had the wound, gave us the wound. That's... The memory, the hurt, the pain, anything that's attached with that is in that circle right here. This one, he calls beliefs or lies. I'm going to call it ungodly beliefs, okay? So that's the ungodly belief. And... Ungodly beliefs distort our development and their beliefs and lies about ourselves, others, and God. So we have a wound that starts to cause us to have ungodly beliefs about who we are. Maybe you have a little girl who is sexually abused right? And that's the wound. Here she starts to believe, I'm not worth anything. I have no value. And an ungodly belief is formed. Maybe the, your parent neglected you, and that's the wound, and the ungodly belief is, I'm not worth protecting, or I'm not worth taking care of, or nobody will ever take care of me. Here, he goes straight to the vow. I'm going to say in here between the vow and the belief is judgment. 
Judgment. That's your bitter root judgment right here. Because between here and here is a bitter root judgment. But I want you to see the correlation between the ungodly belief and your inner vows. So inner vows, in this part, your inner vow is a protective mechanism. But you, first of all, you have, to, you have a wound, and that thing is going to surround everything. Because that's the thing that you think is protecting you. And it says, so tie, oh, so I'm going to put, show you how it ties together, all right? So you, you have a lie. This is the lie, right? Here's your lie. Men can't be trusted. Now, I'm not saying men can't be trusted. I'm just saying, like, that's the inner vow from whatever, the wound, say the little girl who's sexually abused. Men can't be trusted. Now she makes a bitter root judgment. But the vow for that would be, I will never let, I will never trust a man. So your ungodly belief is very much correlates with your inner vows. And... <clears throat> Once you have that, then you're, then you're kind of sunk. Because guess what? God's a man. Right? Well, he's God. But, he, you know, in terms of he came to earth, right? Wait a second. What did I just do? Sorry. What did I just do? Sorry, I flipped my pages wrong. Oh, okay. Well, these vows here that are covering all this other stuff, the hurt and the ungodly beliefs, they might, um, they usually are made to prevent us from having further pain, but they can end up self-limiting you and isolating you. Because if you say, I'm never going to let anyone in again, and then you're wondering why you don't have any friends, inner vow. Ungodly belief. Jimmy Evans says, the wounds fester so that instead of treating the wounds, we make an inner vow to help avoid further pain. Inner vows cause us to overreact, and then they become a guiding force in our lives. They don't just undermine our emotional stability. They also damage our relationships, including our relationship with God and causes us to act out in unhealthy, irrational ways. Inner vows are sinful. Okay? So we're going to go back to ungodly beliefs. Everyone, to some extent, lives their lives out of wrong beliefs. They are called lies about ourselves, others, or God. We call them ungodly beliefs. In Romans 12, 2, it says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is good and acceptable and the perfect will of God. So what is a belief system? It includes our beliefs, decisions, our attitudes, our agreements, our judgments, our expectations, our bitter root expectations, our vows and oaths, whether they're good or bad. Our belief system, it could be good or bad, but that's what it includes. Ungodly beliefs are all our beliefs, decisions, agreements, vows, oath that don't line up with who God is. They don't line up with his character. They don't line up with his nature. They don't line up with the word. In other words, they are in agreement with the enemy. When we have an ungodly belief, we are in agreement with what the enemy says about us. The perfect ungodly belief is the one that appears to be absolutely truth, true based on facts of our experiences and yet absolutely false on God's word. Okay? No one loves me. 
direct contradiction to the word. I'm all alone, direct comp directly in conflict with the word. I am defective. Doesn't line up with the word. God doesn't love me. But how many times have you heard somebody say that? I was listening to the radio uh, last night, no, two nights ago, and when I was driving on this windy road where I hit a deer, the, uh, the deer ran into my car the week before, and the guy said, God loves you so much that he stretched out his arms to the point of pain. It hit me. It's not like I didn't know that. <laughs> but just the way he was saying it, he goes, when you question whether God loves you, he said he stretched out his arms to the point of pain. I lost it. I'm like trying to drive on this windy road. There's nowhere to pull over, so I had to keep going. I'm like, okay, Lord, let me just cry when I get home. <laughs> but, okay, I will always live in poverty. I will never be loved like other people are loved. It's not safe to have feelings. It's not okay to be me. Those are all ungodly beliefs. We had one lady that came to the Blue House, and she said, we were listening to her story, and she believed that she was weak because of her story. And it actually was the exact opposite. It was the strength in her when we said, do you have any grandchildren? And she said, yeah. I said, do you have one that was the age you were? She said, oh, yeah. I said, could she have done what you did? She goes, she's a baby. And we said, exactly. Do you see how strong you were? But this lady had lived her whole life based on that one lie. And that one lie, when it was broken, she literally sat in a chair for 20 minutes and cried. It was a lie. And I saw her somewhere way down the road, and she said, my life has never been the same again. One ungodly belief broken. One ungodly belief. She lived her whole life based on that one lie that the enemy told her, and it was the exact opposite of what she was. It was amazing. The freedom was amazing. That, that was when we did the dance. Like, we used to go out in the fellowship hall and dance after we'd come out of a meeting. That was incredible because they were just amazing. Like, you see somebody get that set free, you got to do the dance. <laughs> You do. I mean, I'm talking literally we would dance around the fellowship hall screaming and hollering because it was so amazing. There's nothing like seeing somebody get set free. This little sheet I gave you, this is from our ministry application, and it's page 11 from our ministry application. It says, what do you think? This will give you an idea. If you go down, just sit with this for a couple of minutes and go down the list. It'll show you what, if you have ungodly beliefs. I mean, you might have different ones, but... They're so powerful because we live our lives based on them and we judge other people because of them. And that was in this lady's case. She judged other people because of the lies she believed. And that's what we do as well. She was just like a textbook, you know, example. She could have been in the Elijah House book. But <clears throat> we live our, and that's the prayer. It says, forgive me, I forgive those who did this, who helped form this ungodly belief, and you name them, and then you say, and I ask you to forgive me for receiving this lie, for living my life based on it, and for how I've judged other people because of it. But ungodly beliefs are related to demonic oppression. In Exodus 23, 32, it says, make no agreement with them or their gods. They do not live in your land, or they, um, they are not to live in your land, or they will make you sin against me. If you worship their gods, it is sure to be a trap for you. That's what an ungodly belief is. It's a trap. 
that the enemy sets when we're really young. It's just, you know, this, this is happening after we get a wound and then we have a judgment and then we make that vow as a protective coating around us. You got to smash that thing and get to, the, get to the root. The wound is the root. Okay? Believing a lie of the enemy above the word of God partners with demons. And when we pray through an ungodly belief, it gives the, um, that ungodly belief opens the door, inviting Satan in, and it gives him legal permission to stay. But when we break the ungodly belief, it's broken, and the enemy doesn't have access anymore. And that's why at the end of the prayer we say, and I break all agreements with the spirits of darkness and any demons attached to that ungodly belief. This is all restoring the foundations. It's amazing. How were they formed? Early childhood hurts, traumas, repetition of hurts reinforce ungodly beliefs. How about a child who has a daily diet of, you're so stupid? Or what's wrong with you? Or you're so ugly? When you hear that repetitive thing, ungodly beliefs are formed. And it really could be any age. You can be an adult and be in a relationship and somebody's repeatedly saying something to you and you start to get it, um, an ungodly belief. Our natural minds, because of the trauma and the hurt, we can form ungodly beliefs. David talked about generational curses a couple weeks ago. A generational curse could be part of our ungodly beliefs. Family heritage. Unintentionally teach, unintentional teachings by a parent. What would that look like? You are to be seen and not heard. Anybody ever hear that one? <laughs> Shame on you. If you... Um, you need a reason to cry? I'll give you a reason to cry. Or it's not okay to cry. There's a million little things like that that are unintentional. Parents do not understand, if they don't know this, that that's causing an ungodly belief to form. The categories are self, others, or God. Definition of unbelief, which ungodly beliefs are unbelief, in the Greek, I'm just going to read you the part that makes, hits home with this. It's the refusal to believe or to be convinced by the voice of God. The refusal to be convinced by the voice of God. Unbelief. In Restoring the Foundations, it says, The author of Hebrews clearly understood the connection between unbelief and the lack of faith and disobedience. He makes it clear in Hebrews 13, 12, that an unbelieving heart is a sinful heart. David Wilkerson wrote on unbelief in one of his newsletters, calling it the mother of all sins. This sin is the one that gives birth to all the others. Our unbelief makes God a liar. Our un, um, we, when we are afraid to take God at his word and really believe him, we are effectively saying to God, your promise sounds really good, but my problem is too big for you. Or your promises are for others because I'm not worthy to receive them. Declaring that God is a liar can be dangerous to your health and your emotional health. Okay, in Hebrews, um, we're almost done. Hebrews 6, um, 11, 6, it says, without faith it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who diligently seek after him. That was one of pastor's favorite things. He always said that. He always told people that were in a struggle and that were really, really pressing in. He goes, God rewards those who diligently seek after him. If I heard him say it once, I heard him say it at least 500 times because it's true. It's the word. And in Proverbs 23, 7, 
It says, for as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. So when we have these ungodly beliefs, so is he. Right? What we believe, we start to become. So we have to get, we have to transfer from ungodly beliefs to godly beliefs. What's the result of ungodly beliefs? Ungodly belief is like a vice grip putting tight constraints on our lives, and it chokes out the abundant life that God promised us. A vice grip. You ever see one of those things that you just turn the thing and you to hold the wood in place? It's kind of like that thing that I was trying to hold. You know, it presses and presses until it, it's got you stuck. And ungodly beliefs have you stuck. Ungodly beliefs are like spiritual termites that quietly work behind the scenes, um, undermining it, eating away at the faith that is established within us. They constantly gobble, 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 reducing our foundation. Interesting, gobble, gobble, and it's Thanksgiving. <laughs> I thought that was such a weird little thing, gobble, gobble. I'm like, okay, but I wrote. Anyway, how do we, un how do we dismantle an ungodly belief? You need to know the word. You need to know the word because you combat an ungodly belief with the word of God. When your ungodly belief is, I am alone, no, God says that I will never leave you or forsake you. So if he never leaves you or forsake you, you're not alone. Renew your mind. And I'm just going to give you these so you could just write them down because of the time. Romans 12, 2. Ephesians 4, 23. Colossians 3.10, and I'll read this one. 2 Corinthians 10, 3-5. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war in the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God, to the pulling down of strongholds. Ungodly beliefs and inner vows are strongholds. Casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. And who he says we are, right? Bringing every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. We need to take the ungodly beliefs and capture them and take them into the obedience of Christ. And who he says and what he says is the truth. And he's the spirit of truth. So there's another handout, which you could do on your own. But it's, it's from um, Restoring the Foundations. And it's this little handout, and it shows you how to practice how to write an ungodly, uh, a godly belief. So you write down first your godly, ungodly belief, and then you sit with the Lord and ask the Lord for a godly belief instead. And we really encourage people in that to get a scripture that goes with it. Because the enemy can't fight you when you, you say, no, the word says... Right? The word says, even Jesus did that in the, when the devil was coming after him. Right, The word says, it is written. So that's why you could have other things, but look for a scripture that matches you know, your godly belief. So that when the enemy comes, no devil, it is written. God said this about me. This is really a powerful tool. Okay, And then if you look on the back of it, well, there's a prayer that's really good. It's a submission prayer. But let's just pray through one, and then we're good. We're going home, okay? <laughs> we're going to pray through one ungodly belief. So just think if you have an ungodly belief that God showed you while we're here. And you can, when we, we're going to pray through it, and you can just, in the blank, I'll stop for a second, and you fill in your ungodly belief. I was teaching Bible study a couple weeks ago, and I, I don't I, somehow ungodly beliefs came up. And as I was saying something, like it, I couldn't even catch it. The ungodly belief came out of my mouth that I didn't even know was there. And I was like, I had to like stop her. I'm like, oh my goodness. The Lord just showed me, like, it's a major ungodly belief, too. Right there in front of everybody on the Zoom, I was like, okay, 
That's an ungodly belief that I have got to break. And it was such a big one, I can't even tell you. So God always shows you. If your heart is open, he will show you. Okay? So let's start. We're going to start it's, um, the one at the bottom of this page. Okay? I confess my sin and my ancestor's sin of believing the lie that, and you fill in your blank what your lie is. I forgive those who contributed to form my forming this ungodly belief. And, excuse me, and when it says be specific, if it's your mother, if it's your father, if it's a teacher, if it's your husband or your wife, if it's your children, whatever it is, whoever it is, sometimes people have a big long list of who helped form that lie. Just be specific, okay? I ask you, Lord, to forgive me for receiving this ungodly belief, for living my life based on it, and for any way I have judged others because of it. I receive your forgiveness. Lord, on the basis of your forgiveness, I choose to forgive myself for believing this lie. I renounce and break my agreements with this ungodly belief. I break my agreement with the power of darkness, and I cancel all agreements with demons. And I choose to accept, believe, and receive the godly belief, and you fill in your blank. Whatever your is, and I'm telling you, add a scripture so that you could combat the enemy with the scripture. All right, let's pray. Let's just stand up. Father, we just thank you, as I prayed in the beginning, that you are the, you are the spirit of truth, God. God, your truth is before the foundation of the earth. Your truth is when we were being formed in our mother's womb. Your truth is who we are, God. Your truth is and what your word says about us, God. Not what our wound says about us. Father, we ask you to forgive us for allowing that wound to dictate our thoughts, our behavior, or how we, how we move in you. Father, we choose to forgive ourselves as well. And Lord, we just thank you for the revelation knowledge that when we come to your feet, Lord, that you so graciously pour out on us. Father, you want us free and walking in the fullness of our destiny more than we want us free because you have a plan and a purpose and a destiny that was set before the foundation of this earth was ever laid. Father, we were on your heart way back then. You knew what our trials and struggles would be, Lord God. You know what our victories would be. And Father, you always make a way of escape. And Father, when we pull those petals off that daisy, it's just like you know, Nellie sang, he loves you, 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 he loves you. And he loves you some more. Father, we thank you for your love. We thank you for that unconditional love. We thank you that your perfect love casts out every fear that came in with that wound, God. The fear that prevents us from breaking forth through those, those circles, Father, into freedom. We thank you, Father, for freedom. And we thank you that your perfect love casts it out, God. That we would walk in the fullness of each, each person would walk in the fullness of the destiny that you planned for them, Lord God. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, For I know the plans I have for you, 
plans for a hope and a future, not to harm you, but for a hope and a future. Yeah, and if you're hearing and you're saying, well, not me, that's a lie because it's for every one of us. The promises in the word are for every one of us. And Father, we just thank you. God, we're so grateful. We are so grateful, Lord. Father, I love that song that we sang. We're so grateful, Father. And we thank you, Lord God, for loving us beyond our womb, beyond our pain, beyond our vows, beyond our judgments, God. We thank you, Father, for your unconditional, unfailing love. And we just bless your holy name, God, with all that is within us, Father. We bless your holy name. Father, we ask for travel mercies. Father, I ask that as each person goes into um, Thanksgiving next week, God, that it would be such a time of gratefulness and thanksgiving and just joy that is beyond what we could ever hope for or imagine, God. That your joy would permeate our homes, permeate our hearts, as we release our gratitude, Father, and we just thank you and praise you. I pray travel mercies tonight in Jesus' name. Amen.